Welcome. Thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with KPCC, we're an NPR affiliate based in Pasadena. We, you can find us at 89.3 or at kpcc.org. I'm Charlotte Duren. I'm a producer on the in-person team. And before we get started, I just wanted to give you a few ways that you can connect with us tonight. We will be on Twitter tonight talking about this event. Um, you can connect with us at, at kpcc.org. Um, and the hashtag is OC Homeless. And to find out other ways you can connect with us, here is Ashley Alvarado. Thank you. Um, we are doing our very tiny or very quick uh, pledge right now. But I'm really excited to tell you I'm not asking you for money. Um, I am the reason that you have a paper on your chair. And what I am asking for is insights. As Charlotte mentioned, we are based in Pasadena. We do as much as we can to get down here as often as we can. Um, but here's an opportunity for you to fill this out very quickly and tell us what do we need to know about you? How can we do a better job of covering Orange County? Um, also, just anything that's sort of interesting to you. Do you like to cook? Are you a parent? Are you, um, one of the questions we're asking people right now is, what are you thinking about when it comes to the, um, the very likely legalization of recreational marijuana? If you have insights, thoughts, anything on this, um, go ahead and fill it out. There are pins out right outside so you can get one there. Um, and I look forward to collecting them afterward. Thank you. And thank you again for coming out tonight. Just um, some housekeeping before we get started. We are live video streaming this, so um, please take photos, but just make sure the flash is turned off. Uh, for tonight's forum, please no taking videos, um, no streaming on Facebook or anything like that. We will have a stream available at kpcc.org slash in person um, if you want to stream this event. Um, so again, thank you, and I'd like to introduce now the host of tonight's forum. It's our Orange County reporter, uh, Erica Aguilar. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for coming today. We really appreciate you coming out today on a work night um, for this really important topic. Um, I've been covering Orange County for about roughly two years for KPCC, and one of the things that has really struck me and captured my reporting attention is homelessness in this county. Um, maybe it's because when you go down to the Civic Center in Santa Ana, where everybody goes and has to at some point, it is impossible to ignore. Or maybe it's because when you're driving down the five, you can see the homeless tents along the Santa Ana River. Um, or when you pass by on Chapman Avenue Bridge. Um, it just seems something that we just can't, I can't possibly ignore. And it's captured my attention. And more than anything, the number of homeless people who've sort of reached out to me and asked me about <laughs> what, is, uh, what are law, uh, law enforcement doing? Or what are county officials doing? Um, they come to my email box and my calls and my social media uh, streams all the time and ask uh, me to cover stories, and I do it because I think it's an important issue, and I think um, your attendance tonight says that it's an important issue to you as well. We know that over the course of one year, roughly 15,000 people in Orange County will experience homelessness for at least one night over the course of the year, and that's according to the last homeless count in 2015. Orange County officials are right now um, gearing up for a 2017 count. It's an imperfect science, but it allows us to understand what the problem might be like in Orange County. But going back to that 2015 count, we know that on that night when volunteers went out around the county and counted, we know that they counted 40, approximately 4,400 people in Orange County that were homeless. And about half of them were in shelters. And about the other half lived in RVs, in cars, in tents, on sidewalks, and in benches. Homelessness is an important topic in Orange County, in Southern California. So we're here tonight to sort of discuss and understand what the problem may be and how do we all sort of work together to end it because we know living out on the street, dying on the street, being hungry on the street, that's not something that we want for each other and for this county. Um, we all have different ideas on how to do it, but I think if we work collaboratively, we all will find um, 
a way to sort of solve this. So I hope we, we have lots of discussion tonight. I want you to participate. I want you to also know that you um, have your comment cards. We're going to take some questions tonight, and we really want to dig into this issue and also turn it around and allow you to ask those questions and make those comments. So with that, I'm going to introduce some of our guests on our panel tonight. We have a lot of people, and, and I will say that <laughs> we know homelessness is a layered topic. We need people from all sorts of the safe, social safety net. Um, the stage is not big enough for everybody, but we've, we've, we've got a really great panel tonight, and I really hope we're going to get into some of these issues. So with that, I'm going to introduce our first panel guest. Um, that's Orange County Supervisor Andrew Doe. He represents the first district. Our other guest is Eve Garrow. She's a policy analyst focusing on homelessness for the ACLU of Southern California in Orange County. Our next guest is Paul Leon. He's the CEO of Illumination Foundation, a homeless services nonprofit, and they do a lot more than that. Our next guest is Dawn Price. She's executive director of the Friendship Shelter in Laguna Beach, which sleeps about 45 people a night in South County, and they too do a lot more than that. <laughs> and last, but of course not least, is Larry Smith, or better known as Smitty. He's an active member of the Civic Center Roundtable, a notable homeless advocate in Orange County, and someone I always go to to understand the situation on the ground much better. So again, just a reminder, um, you do have comment cards. Please listen in. Um, and you have a, com a, a comment or a question, we're going to take them throughout the conversation, pass them around. Um, our, our guests at KPCC will collect them and then we'll, we'll go through those comments and questions and have an opportunity for some Q&A at the end. But um, first off, we'll, 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 we'll get it started. Uh, we know that homelessness has increased over the last two years by 5%, and that's again according uh, to the 2015 homeless count. Uh, but I've always wondered, you know, what is behind that increase? What are the contributing factors? Uh, Supervisor Doe, um, some of your district experiences, some of this homelessness in the first district in central Orange County, what can you tell us about what are some of those contributing factors to the homelessness and, and the population here in Orange sure. County? Sure. I think as the economy uh, picks up and our um, uh, workforce has uh, increased in size, uh, both in terms of the uh, residents that we have, but also uh, employ uh, workers coming from outside of the county into the county and so as um, the more pressure is being brought to bear on the housing stock that we have uh, especially in the first district um, it drives up the cost of housing and so it makes it less affordable for people hmm. um, Smitty can I ask you um, what have you seen on the ground um, tell us what have you seen over the last two years in terms of the number of people who've become homeless it's a large increase uh, and recently there's been a large increase of young people under the age of 25, uh, mainly because they can't get jobs that pay enough to actually support themselves. Not only not getting housing, but they can't even live on the street with what they actually earn. So. It's, it's an increase. A lot of people got left behind when the economic crisis was over. Uh, well, not completely over yet, but so that's part of the increase. But there's nowhere to go. Uh, this county has a reputation for a 1% or 2% vacancy rate, which is great if you uh, need a place to live, but can you afford it? And a lot of people can't. So affordable housing, uh, the lack of housing, the lack of available housing in Orange County. I, I, I wanna say um, the Orange County Register this morning uh, 
quoted a Trulia report that found that nearly 55% of one studio, uh, one bedroom, one uh, studio bedrooms and two bedroom homes um, were affordable or considered affordable. Um, and that's down about 10 percentage points. Um, so affordable housing and the lack of stock seems to be something that contributes. Uh, Don, tell us uh, what you see in South County. Well, I think that housing costs are absolutely a major driver in South County as well. And that's also going to drive whether how quickly and how we can solve this problem because housing is the solution. So that is a double-edged sword in terms of both causing homelessness and, and keeping us from solving it as quickly as we can. Uh, the other contributing factor that doesn't show up yet in the numbers, but I think will in the 2017 count, has been unintended consequences from Prop 47. Hmm. And while that, uh, th that was legislation that did some good things in terms of decriminalizing and not categorizing people as criminals, there wasn't enough backup for that in terms of what happens when people are sent out of jail or aren't jailed that have serious problems. And so more of those folks are ending up on the street and we're seeing that, police departments are seeing that, than maybe would have before because the jails are not a, the, the de facto shelter they were before. And so that's gonna be a driving factor going forward, I think. I think it's important to segment though. And um, actually the, between that 2011 or 2013 count and 2015 count, the number of chronically homeless people dropped. That's right. So we By are like seeing- By like 30%. Yes, so we are seeing some uh, movement from some of the early permanent supportive housing solutions that we've started uh, to put in place here. And I, I'm hoping we'll see more of that going forward. Eve, I know you work with a lot of these, uh, the population, um, and I know the ACLU works a lot on Prop 47 issues. Um, how, how, how has Prop 47 sort of contributed from your perspective? Um, from my perspective, I would say that um, I, I attended um, a public safety hearing recently, um, a, a county level public safety hearing. And what I said during that hearing was, um, if, if you were getting out of jail or prison, no job, no place to live, what would you need? Mm -hmm. You would need a place to live. You might need some help connecting to a job. Um, it, I mean, it's, yes, people will become homeless with, if, if they are released to the streets with no help. So the county can do a lot in terms of providing some of that aid. We need definitely more affordable housing. What people um, who are homeless tell me is, you know, I try to find affordable housing. So if you're homeless, um, you go to the county website, perhaps you go to the, um, the website for the housing authority. Those lists are closed. So there is no access to, people really need to understand that, that in terms of affordable housing, there is no access to affordable housing in this county. Um, if you are lucky enough to get on a waiting list, you will wait between four and eight years for, to, to get to the top of that list and be able to um, obtain affordable housing. So we do have a crisis. Um, we rely almost exclusively on federal and state funds, which are either stagnant or shrinking. They reach about 25% of all of those who are eligible for um, affordable housing, for subsidized affordable housing in this county, leaving about, according to a recent study, about 100,000 people um, who are eligible for affordable housing with no way to access it. And, and that, you know, going back to your first question in terms of what are some of the drivers of, um, of this increase in, housing, in, in homelessness, I mean, if you have more people falling into homelessness than people becoming housed, you're gonna see an increase in homelessness. And if there's no access to affordable housing, then um, you're going to see an increase in homelessness over time. Supervisor Doe. Yes, um, as a former DA, I want to clarify a couple of things for the audience. Um, the main driver in terms of people being relocated um, inmates, to former state prisoners, into Orange County is AB 109. Um, that is the, uh, the reclassification um, right. mm -hmm. of, of uh, bringing prisoners down to, the, uh, to be supervised by the probation department at the county level. Uh, that's realignment. Um, Prop 47 merely reclassified a, a broad 
category of crime from felony to misdemeanors. So therefore, well, it, it was, it, there are certain drug crimes, and, sure. and it, it, it did require a certain amount of drug that had to be on the person. But what I'm saying is that when it reclassified those crimes from felony to misdemeanors, that Prop 47 didn't bring additional people back into the county. Those offenders are already here. It's just that their offenses are reclassified. But when, with the, the driver that brought inmates down into Orange County uh, to the tune of 9,000 former state prisoners being brought down to be supervised by our probation department, that's AB 109. So I want to make sure we distinguish between the two. I see. Well, one of the things I know and I, and I, and I hear about um, and read about is um, the release of, of jail inmates from uh, county facilities or county jails uh, at midnight. And I'm thinking, well, if you're released at midnight, um, and, and you may not have a place to go. Where do you go? Maybe you go to the Civic Center. Um, uh, have, there, have, there, have there been any changes in, in those policies? Do you think a policy where uh, jail inmates are released during the day could possibly help where a shelter may be available? Sure, we have uh, explored that uh, possibility and we will continue to explore that. But um, we have to reconcile the release time with all of the responsibilities that the jail has to do in terms of transporting inmates to court for their open cases and then do bed checks and then do their daily count. A lot of things have to happen uh, during the, the normal day hours, uh, daylight hours. So it's really hard to, to then process people while all of that is going on as well. But we can certainly do, you know, uh, have a better policy than it's not actually midnight, it's 2 a.m. in the morning is when they are normally released. <laughs> 2 a.m., so, wow. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, we talked about shelter, right? Um, so if you're released at 2 a.m. and you're trying to look for a shelter, we know that in Orange County, um, there are yeah. shelter options, but they're not as many. Um, let's talk about what shelter options are available right now. I know that um, we've watched uh, the Board of Supervisors uh, set aside money uh, for a year-round homeless shelter, or I should say a multi-service center, which will be opened in 2017 here in Anaheim. It'll be the first one that the county runs at its year around. Is that enough, and should we, should we be doing that? That is not enough, and uh, we are fighting to have more, um, and we uh, are acquiring uh, facilities uh, all the time. Whenever they are become available, we will buy them up. Just like the uh, transit terminal in Santa Ana. We don't know what will be, uh, what use we'll be making of the transit terminal, but it's definitely uh, being added to our, um, to our portfolio of properties that we can use as a possible uh, shelter. We already are using the transit terminal as part of our uh, El Nino emergency shelter. The transit terminal is um, located in Santa Ana at the Civic Center. It's yeah. been shuttered for quite a number of years. Right. And then during the El Nino season, um, homeless people were allowed to sort of stay in there, but only during rainy days. Right. Um, the reason is this. We recently uh, purchased uh, the uh, transit terminal from OCTA. And OCTA used funding from the Department of Transportation, that's a federal agency, to purchase the terminal way back 20 years ago. Right. <coughs> And as part of the limitation of that funding is they have to use that facility only for transit purposes. But now that it's under the county, Sure, but it, uh, escrow just closed about a week ago. Do you have a plan for it then? Because I haven't heard one. Well, sure. Uh, we, have, we have plans and we are exploring different uses, but I can't speak for the board. That's a board's decision. So you're so. still working on a right. plan? Yes. There hasn't been one that's been published just yet? Or Not yet, that's right. Has it been publicly talked about? Um, I certainly have ideas, but again, Will I- Will you share I, them? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> um, I will say that the, uh, the we're jumping on the, the bus transit terminal thing. Um, um, I, I'm just gonna say that the Orange County Civic Center Roundtable actually did a lot of work in advocating for what the bus terminal in Santa Ana um, can and, and should be. Uh, Smitty, will you share with us what you think maybe that place can serve? A service center, a support center, not a shelter, uh, where we can go, you can get your, whatever you need to get back into the system um, on a daily basis. Such as storage it's, or something, or? At one storage, at one, uh, hygiene is another, uh, food, basically a service center 
for the homeless in the Civic Center. Now, there may be long range plans for housing and shelters and those things, but at this time, there needs to be relief from what's taking place in the plaza right now. now in the Civic Center right now? Yeah, it's been over 20 years and nothing's been done. I mean, not even an attempt. You have this issue where we at the bottom see a fight or some kind of harassment game between the city and the county. Uh, we don't want you over here. This is our side or that's our side. Or it, it, If you're not at a higher level, at, at maybe management level, it seems like a childish game that people are playing with other people's lives. I see. Um, I want to. I want to talk about. Um, I want to go back to the shelter issue um, because I, I do want to talk about whether um, there are enough shelter beds. I. I know. I'm in. Uh, I attend a lot of meetings. Um, the Commission to End Homelessness is one of those, and I feel like there, there's a lot of discussion right now, um, and especially at the county staff level, about right sizing our system or right sizing um, the county. Asking ourselves, um, how many shelter beds do we have? and what are the barriers into getting into some of those shelter space. Um, Paul, I wanna hear from you. Your uh, organization is on the ground a lot and you guys do a lot of outreach. Are there enough shelter beds? Do, what, what, are, what, are, what are people telling you? Well, obviously there's not enough shelter beds, but I think Schmidt put it best when he just said, we've been talking about this for 10 years, that, that we've been started. Um, you know, it's a complex problem, but even given that substance abuse, mental health um, issues, as a public health nurse, that's a crisis in any city that needs to be attended to immediately. And we've talked about a lot of things, but not a lot of action. And, and we obviously need various shelters. And if you look nationwide, um, I'm on a couple of committees and I'm on a board of National Healthcare for the Homeless. They have situations where they have a multitude of different types of shelters. And you need that, especially in a, in a county the size of ours, 3.2 million. You need emergency shelters, you need medical beds, you need recuperative beds, um, long-term, short-term. And so my big concern. Beds. Sorry, I'm just going to give the definition real quick. A recuperative bed. A recuperative care bed is a bed that a uh, homeless individual is discharged from the hospital. They're able to attend to their daily needs, but still not well enough to go out um, into the street and to be discharged safely into the street. You and I, if we're in the hospital and we go home, we usually don't go right back to work. We, we need to convalesce for a few days um, or a few weeks. So the Hospital Association of California a few years ago started recuperative care where the patients are discharged to us, uh, Illumination Foundation, and we take care of them anywhere from 15 to up to a year on, in some wow. instances. Um, but that type of bed obviously is for the medical need. Um, mental health, substance abuse, we need to expand those. But we haven't even started in Orange County, and that's a huge concern on any type of pilot programs. We, we just started on a, a few um, permanent housing programs, but the other, uh, the other type of shelter beds that are a little bit more complex, we've not really started any pilot programs. We haven't put the attention to um, to, um, like Smitty was saying, the actual street, Civic Center, Anaheim. You could look in any city and find the pockets of individuals that are homeless, and 10%, approximately 10% of them are medical, mental health, substance abuse. Um, they're in need of that. And you can't just put those individuals in any type of shelter. So. To us, that that's the most vulnerable population we're looking at. Don, um, you're you're shaking your head a yeah. lot, and I know it's because you uh, run a, a friendship shelter in Laguna Beach. But also, well, you, you guys have had some progress with uh, a couple of grants. We we operate two shelters. Friendship Shelter does, and I'm a I'm a shelter fan in the sense that it keeps people safe, 
and it also helps us assess and engage people. But I think our goal should be that shelter is a very short-term stay and that we're looking at housing solutions. So what we learned in the past year, there's a collaboration of agencies that received a, a federal HUD grant to do 2. some- 2.5 million? Uh, 2.6 million okay. almost to provide a permanent supportive housing and the goal was 100 people. To house 100 people, uh, the grant started in September and we housed our 100th person at the end of March. So with will and urgency and money, uh, we can do a lot of good things very quickly, and we need more of all of those things. Um, shelter, we found, in that experiment was critical. Our shelter in Laguna Beach that the City of Laguna Beach funds, 45 beds a night there, we were able to assess people quickly because we had standing relationships with the most vulnerable people in our city. We were able to engage most, not all, and it's, it's, we need to fix uh, who's engaged and how we engage them. But we were able to assess people very quickly. We were able to house out of that room, that single room, 44 people, 44 of the 100 came from that room because I believe we had standing relationships with those folks. We didn't have to go out and find them in the riverbed, find them in the Civic Center. They were people we had engaged since 2009. How long have they been staying at that shelter? Some people had been using that shelter as de facto housing since we opened in 2009. And so and what are the lengths of stays now um, as you move them into some of that permanent So we're seeing much shorter, set, shorter stays. We still have some of the very most vulnerable people. There's, a, there's some work yet to be done in advocating on a federal level for what's required in order to get someone into housing and what sort of buy-in we need um, from the client in terms of paperwork and things that someone who's seriously challenged with a mental health disability has difficulty signing a lot of federal paperwork. Sure. And, and so uh, we need to work with in what our folks are capable of doing and get them into housing more swiftly. I think that's coming and I think we have data now that can show why we need to make those changes. But globally, 100 people housed in just a little bit over six months is an incredible step, especially when you consider that the last count found slightly over 500 total chronically homeless people. So to have housed 100 chronically homeless people and the most vulnerable 100 chronically homeless people that we assessed during that time is a big step forward and we just need to do, I believe, much more of that. Eve, I know that the ACLU has a different idea on whether um, shelters are the right place to sort of assess or to gather or, or to even to have. Mm -hmm. um, talk to me a little bit more about that and what may be an alternative solution. So um, for, first I'll just say, you know, it's, it, it, it is true that we don't have enough shelter space to accommodate everyone. I think the county's own um, inventory shows that there is about enough shelter and transitional housing to accommodate about one out of every two people who are homeless. And you, you started, um, you, in your introduction, you talked about how about half, half of all people on any given night who are homeless are unhoused, and this is really why. And, and transitional housing, we're, define transitional housing for us. That would be um, a, a program similar to Friendship Shelter, which is, it's, it's a sort of a short-term program, um, it's, it's not a shelter. You generally would have your own room or share, share a room with someone else and you go through a program, maybe like a six to six month to a year to perhaps an 18 month program. I think federal uh, HUD um, defines it as 24 months as a max, but then yeah, 30 days yeah. as a minimum. As a minimum. Yeah, that's not what Friendship Shelter does, just to clarify. I'm sorry. We, we're, we're, <laughs> a, a, we're a rehabilitative residential shelter but we, are, we, we aren't time limited like transitional would be. It's not time limited. So, um, so, um, so, so uh, when you combine transitional programs with um, emergency shelter, um, it really only reaches about half of all people leaving the other half on the streets, living in our parks and sidewalks and in the riverbed, not by choice, but because there's no place for them to go. Um, so definitely as a, um, we don't want anybody to be on the street for even one day and for people who can tolerate emergency shelter, it's fine. I think like the 2000 and, in a 2013 report, 
um, the county showed that about 2% of all people who use the shelters transition to um, subsidized housing, affordable housing. That's... And that is because that housing simply doesn't exist. So I think Don is right in that we really need, um, we need more funding for permanent supportive housing, for affordable housing, so that if we created more shelter, it doesn't simply turn into a holding place um, for people who can't afford housing um, in, in, in the private market. Now, one of the other issues with the emergency shelter is that all of the research shows that, um, that people who are chronically homeless, and these are people who have been homeless for a long period of time, um, coupled with serious disabilities, often cannot tolerate um, the congregate um, environment of emergency it's shelter. Too intense. The crowd, yes, the huh. the crowding, um, the the noise, um, the chaos that can accompany You're putting you know forty five to like a couple of hundred people together um, in very close quarters in one room, maybe lined up on cots or mats um, all together in in a space. So people who are chronically homeless tend to avoid to shy away from shelters, not to use them. And in part, this is to, men to manage their mental health issues. So is the solution then there, are you saying that the solution then is, is to do permanent supportive or rapid rehousing, which is um, giving somebody uh, money in order to pay for rent for an Quite, apartment, or right. what, what, do, what do you think? So, so the nationally recognized best model is a housing first model, right. and that is permanent supportive housing as an immediate response to somebody's need. And that's putting somebody in a, in a home, in an, an apartment, apartment and giving them the wraparound case management services. Exactly, exactly. So when Don talked about these 100 units, these, these were uh, units of permanent supportive housing. Paul, you wanted to say something? Yeah, just, you know, because there's all different kinds. Housing first, obviously, is the buzzword right now nationally. I mean, you want to put people in housing right away. However, there's a lot of people that aren't really ready for housing. And I don't suggest that we go back to a traditional plan where we got them housing ready. But we also have to realize that- What does housing ready mean? It was more they would stay in a shelter and try to you know, have them work to deserve housing and say this person now is ready to move into housing. The housing first model that started about 20 years ago um, was the premise was put somebody in housing, they will do what they need to do to stay in housing. And for all intents and purposes, that works with a certain population. But as we talked about, there's, there's different populations, there's all different complexities to why people are homeless. Each one of them, you know, as a provider, and there's many providers in this room, we handle a certain type of client that needs that specialty care. So you have to have the wraparound services. And one of the biggest myths that we have been struggling against it the last 10 years, and I've talked, spoken with uh, county officials, city officials, was that, wow, the homeless really don't want to go into a shelter. And, you know, when, when if, some, if I was homeless and someone asked me would I want to go to a shelter to go in there and potentially be beat up, robbed, or in a room with 300 people, I wouldn't go to a shelter either. So they're taking that answer as they don't really want shelter. I, I want, let's talk, let's ask Mitty. Are, yeah, would you, what, what, what are the barriers? The, the barriers. What, so, um, so the conversation was, you know, some the, people don't want to do it. What the national model, which should be, is what the Salvation Army does. Which is? You go, you show your ID, you don't bring any drugs or alcohol or under the influence. You get a bed for 14 nights. You're out during the day, but for 14 nights you have a place to sleep, you are fed. You're not required to do anything. You are offered services, but it's your choice. You're talking about like programming here, right? Like programs that you have to enroll in or checkpoints or check times. The, the models that are being used, not that one, are regulations, rules, guidelines, barriers to be in the shelter. But wouldn't, so 
to play devil's advocate here, doesn't that provide some kind of structure and help somebody um, try to find their way out of homelessness? Well, it would work if the person had just become homeless or mm -hmm. was only homeless for six months. Mm -hmm. You have a whole population out there that's been on the streets eight, nine, 10, 20 years, right? <laughs> that's their home, the streets. They know every move to make. They know when to be where. It, it's like the point in time count, uh, why it can't be done. Homeless live on the street. They do not let the sun catch them sleep because people come to their businesses or go into their garages and people who sleep there during the night have to be up so that that person doesn't know they've been sleeping there. Now, this is the way the homeless live on the street. We don't let the sun catch us sleep. Now, in the Civic Center, you have a whole different... <laughs> you have a whole different situation. But throughout the county, which is why you don't know how many people are out there. I think I've seen it a couple of times in Huntington Beach, actually. Um, it's, it's, it's almost impossible to do a count because we stay invisible for a reason. It's just like you're doing outreach. A lot of people out there who've been there for years are not going to tell you anything about themselves, mostly not even their names. I mean, they'll go to the shelter and you'll have Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck, <laughs> Bill Clinton. And what you do then is you count the space that's filled. You don't count the person because you don't know who the person is. Sometimes they'll give you their ID, but most of the time they will not. So we like to stay invisible, but unfortunately, because of the size, we can't always stay invisible, which is what's brought a lot of attention and a lot of unintended consequences. You mean the size, you mean the, the, size, the, the growing population, and I'm going to assume you're talking about Civic Center right now? Yes. Oh. Uh, the people you see out there, they're, they're not a whole lot of new arrivals. 109, although it did let a lot of people out of prison, most of them are immediately got help from the state, and most of them got housing because of the program or because of the way 109 was written that the state would reimburse or pay for or take care of those people. The earlier ones didn't get anything, but the ones that came later actually got support to get off the street. So it didn't really, 109 didn't really increase the population. And it certainly didn't bring a whole lot of people to Orange County, but they did bring some. So, but the population you see has always been there. It's uh, eight, nine, 10, 20 years. They've Don, been there. You just don't see them. You see a lot of uh, folks coming into the shelter. I'm sorry? You see a lot of folks coming into your shelter in the South County. A lot of people coming in. People coming in. Yes, right. we do. Um, two, two things, sure. two themes I'm hearing here that I, I, th I just like to give our perspective on based on our experience. And you know, prior to this collaborative project, we had 21 uh, people in permanent supportive housing for about 18 months prior to that. We now have 60. Um, two things. I think that the, the, in terms of housing, I, I disagree respectfully that people need to be ready. I think we need to be ready for them. I think our system and our housing uh, stock needs to be ready for whoever comes into our housing and that's what housing first is and so we have not found people who we could not work with and could not stay housed in our entire time of doing this we've lost two people they were people who needed to go into some substance abuse treatment and and one is already back in housing and another ha is is in treatment. And so we can work with just about anyone if we're willing. And it has to do with changing how we work with people. Traditional case management where you sit at a desk and you give people a list of goals and then they come back in a week and you see whether they've met their goals. With a chronically homeless person who's dealing with a serious mental health challenge, that's not what they need. They need us in their apartment helping them do stuff, helping them access services. If, we, if they need help cleaning, we need to help them clean. We need to do whatever it takes to keep them housed. So that's, that's one. 
The second thing I'm hearing is about thresholds for shelter, and I think that's a really important point. I would say even an ID is an un, un uh, accessible shelter for it's some people. It's really hard uh, to yeah. get and yeah. keep an identification yeah, that's, card that's when a, you are That raises transient. the threshold, and so um, I think shelters need to be as open as they can possibly be so that there is no barrier to people getting that first step. They absolutely need to come out of that shelter into housing as quickly as possible, especially the most vulnerable people, especially people who have mental health challenges need to get into, into housing for some of the reasons that have already been mentioned. Uh, Supervisor. I don't know about the audience, but I, I think this is where I reach the point where the experts in, in dealing with homelessness, they seem to speak a, a, a language of their own and, you know, <laughs> And, and th their approach is so singular to their organization and their perspective that it, it leaves me confused. You mean um, it, it feels too policy heavy? Well, no, because people, I think, are trying too hard to find a solution. I start with the premise that there is no one solution. As many homeless individuals as we have in our society, that we have that many solutions that we need because each person's situation is unique. So I, after talking to all the stakeholders in the county, in the major group from nonprofits to housing experts um, to different county departments, what I think we need to, to ask ourselves, is homelessness the disease itself or is it a symptom of some other disease? And so if it is a symptom, then we need to do, to, I'm, I'm borrowing from medical terms here, terminology. If it is merely a symptom, then we need to deal with the source of the problem, right? Whatever that, that source is. We know 60% of the homeless individuals have some kind of mental health issues. Over 50% have some kind of criminal justice uh, type of involvement, whether they're on probation, parole, or an open active case. Um, we have uh, uh, people on the street, maybe because they can't find housing because of, uh, they are uh, 290 registration. That's the uh, sex registration, if they're offend, uh, and then they, you have 11590, which is drug registration. There are a lot of limitations on their ability to find a job and find housing. So these are all contributing factors into homelessness. And so in order for us to solve homelessness, we have to address the factors that feed into homelessness. And then what can we do to get them out of homelessness, even on a transitional level, then we have to find a, a, a mechanism in which we can help them with the wraparound service and the follow-up service so that they don't recur and go back into homelessness. It sounds like to me that you're saying um, you need to provide services before housing. Is that what you're saying? No. Okay. What we ne need is we need to find out what their needs are, and we have to have mechanisms in place to deal with the different types of issues that are out there. There are people that are ready for transitional housing, they go there. Some people are further along and they may be ready for permanent housing, they go there. But there are people that need help with their other issues, mental health, mm -hmm. for instance. We need to, to be able to earn that trust, build that relationship, so that they will make themselves available to the services that we provide. Right now, we can't even reach them. We, can, we have healthcare agency employees walking up and down the Civic Center and, and other locations around the county, making ourselves available to help them. But you know what? Very few of them actually do take advantage of our help. Why? Because we have not set up a system where we earn their trust, where, we, where they see the services that we provide as being effective. Because what they see is a lot of open doors. I'll give you an example. If you were to have, look at a homeless person, each aspect of their life, they have to go to a different department to get help for, right? Whether it be Medi-Cal through uh, CalOptima, uh, food stamp welfare through, through social services, or they have to go to healthcare agency for their mental health. Th th those are just the main three. And, they and we are expecting them right now to go to each department on their own to get that help. We need to have a system in place where they only need to, pl to have one phone number to call, one person one caseworker. So when they call, they will have access to all of these, all of the services that Isn't we that have. Isn't that what 211 serves? No, because it's not part of the county. Yeah. Um, you know, when, 
I don't think you were talking about me saying you had to be housing ready, correct? Well, you I, talked about readiness. So, well, yeah, yeah, no, but we're housing <laughs> yeah. for, we're a housing ahead, first yeah. harm reduction program. Great. Great. And I believe totally in that. But, you know, having been a healthcare agency, public health nurse for the county, working for the county, I was started Chat H, which is the outreach in the Civic Center. On the backside, we had absolutely no tools. So I can engage, let's say Schmitty, not Schmitty, but somebody in the, in the um, Civic Center, I could talk to them all day long. And I couldn't refer them anywhere. I couldn't refer them to a medical place. I couldn't refer them to housing. Many of the, the um, nonprofits that I would try to refer individuals and families to would not, had such a high threshold, they wouldn't take the clients I was trying to refer them to. So, you know, it does no good to keep adding public health nurses if you don't have housing on the back end. So it, it basically is a continuum. And to a layperson who just walks in, they probably would get tied up in all the vocabulary, just like we probably would with the Board of Supervisors. We did, you walk in one of those meetings, I don't even know what they're talking about. So you, you definitely have to learn the vocabulary, but I think, the, you know, what Don's talking about and the other actual providers in the room, we understand housing first. You understand transitional housing. You understand there's, there's not that much vocabulary. If you can take an individual and put them in housing, they will more than likely stay in housing. And some need some wraparound service. That's pretty simple, com, you know, um, pretty simple complex, uh, uh, concept, but when we're short, over 100,000 apartments, we're short over 100,000 apartments, right. and I see some housing people in here, and we're working with them, but it, it's not even close. We will never get to the point we need unless we have leadership that's in the county saying, we're going to make a commitment to spend money on true affordable housing. And to make the and to make and to make RFPs um, and you know what most people know what RFPs are their proposition yeah. yeah thank you so that all the nonprofits can compete for those and right now um, our county issues RFPs that are I, I don't think they're meant for sp specific nonprofits but what happens there's so many restrictions on it that as a provider and a nonprofit, we look at them like, well, why are we gonna apply? We, we don't have 24 hour on-call services and only maybe one person does, one of the nonprofits. So they're so skewed because, because we don't understand what that process is that we're not able to access a lot of the money that's within the county. Well, uh, Supervisor, I wanna give you a chance to respond. Right. I think the, the whole idea of housing, it's, it's the right idea, but, the, but the, in the implementation is where I think people don't fill in the gap for the public. When you talk about transitional housing, we, the model is you have to take the patient as they are, meaning you have to put them in housing with whatever conditions that they have, okay? So therefore, the whole readiness is not even addressed. Now, will the public accept transitional housing of people who are going to be shooting up drugs, using public dollars in their housing in order to, with all the conditions that they are in, before we treat them, before we get them ready. If the, if the public says that, yes, that's something that we accept, then that's, it's workable. But I'm telling you, not a lot of neighborhoods is going to accept that concept. I, well, maybe. I, I may be corrected here, but I think HUD already says that housing first is the way we're going to go because in the last continu continuum of care funding um, uh, round, they've done away with 1.5 million for transitional housing and said if Orange County you want to house people, do permanent supportive housing with wraparound or rapid rehousing. And if you want the other programs, you're going to have to sort of find funding on your own or find a way to do that. Um, so th that would be the county. The part of, of what we have here, and the, the blame is put on the, on the county and specifically the Board of Supervisors. We can only allocate funds. We can only do policy. It's still the neighborhood, it's still the, the, the cities that will have to accept what we want to do, right? And so it is really challenging for us 
to, to respond to these claims that somehow we are, are falling short. I can't answer for the prior boards, but this board has been doing more in the last 15 months. And we have our uh, care coordinator who is taking a, a, you know, a dealing with this issue as care we speak. You don't, I know, supervisor, you don't like it when I call him the homeless czar, but that seems to be the thing that everybody says it, but homeless czar. Um, uh, no. Susan Price, who uh, was just hired in the last few weeks. I think right. she's joined us here. Yes, she's on the, over here, yeah. Oh, there you yeah. are. <laughs> Hi, Susan Price. And, well, and you know what? Um, I want to take this moment to, to ask, um, Susan, if you don't mind, um, <laughs> we're having this conversation. It's, it's a great time to say, um, I mean, we're, we're talking about what should be done, you know, uh, to end homelessness. We're talking about finding housing that's available. You've only been in the job two weeks. <laughs> I'm going to put you on the spot. But um, easy question. Tell me, what are your top three to-do items on your list for the next month? It's something that you're going to be working on in the next couple of months um, uh, on this topic of, of housing the homeless. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Thank you all for being here, first of all. This is a very important topic that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, three things. Uh, there's a million things, but you want three. Well, yeah, what, what's on the top of your to-do list? I think that there's a tremendous amount of resource in the county of Orange, and I've spent the last 14 days interacting with a lot of people that are doing great work. What I'd like to do on one of those top three things is definitely make sure that everything that we're doing creates a pathway to permanent housing. Permanent housing. So that's one. Um, number two, make sure that everybody gains access to the things that they're eligible for, whether that be mainstream benefits, disability, affordable housing. Um, affordable housing in Orange County, it's kind of a very difficult topic, and I know it's been talked about quite a bit here. Um, that is going to be something that requires very creative solutions. It's going to require landlord incentives, a lot of housing navigation, um, I've got a million ideas about how we can really start to leap over some of the barriers that we've been facing regionally, not just in Orange County. Um, let's see, what would be the third one? <sighs> <laughs> My mind is swimming, as you might have mentioned. Uh, you Take know, invent inventory of what we have uh, resources at the county, right? I've, I've spent 14 days doing that, and I'm going to need a little bit more time. Yeah. So I, I would really appreciate um, all of your patience as I work through this. But I, I want to assure you that I'm not new on the topic and that I have a tremendous amount of experience running a continuum of care in a neighboring city for the past 14 years. That's Long where Beach. We've had, right. Yes, Long Beach, where we've had tremendous success. And I would expect that we would be able to do the same thing right here in Orange County, um, I do want to take a moment to thank the Board of Supervisors and Andrew Doe for creating this position, number one, but for putting it in the CEO's office, because that really gives me an opportunity to work across systems, to make sure that we're not siloed, and that we're working with all of our partners to maximize the resources and that they're targeted effectively to the populations that are most in need. And that's something that I am definitely going to hone in on is the targeting of resources, because do we have enough resources for everybody? Probably not, but are we targeting them to have the greatest impact for our communities? I think we can do better. Are you focusing only on homelessness, Susan? No. Right. Yeah. Homelessness has many tributaries, as I you see. said earlier. There are a lot of reasons people, why. People that fall through the cracks of multiple systems can find mm -hmm. themselves in a homeless situation, could be any one of us. Whether you're on the panel or you're in the audience, you probably know somebody that's experienced homelessness in their lifetime. It's something that none of us are immune to. And so, you know, it's, it's definitely, there's a lot of tributaries. We talked about some legislative impacts that are really giving us some challenges that we haven't uh, faced up to this point. Um, but I, I will say to you that, you know, my experience is that all barriers have solutions. And it's going to take all of us, by the way. It's not going to be just me. I'm not going to solve it alone. I look in the audience and I see a lot of people that are going to help us do this. It's going to take all of us. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you yeah. for coming up and, and answering those three questions for me. <laughs> you, you looked at me and you wanted to respond. <laughs> 
So um, creating a pathway to permanent housing sounds great, but that housing has to exist. Um, I, I'll just, I, I would like to give two short um, stories about people that I know. One is a woman who's been living, she's 66 years old, she's been living in the Civic Center for the last nine years. She's disabled. Last year she had open heart surgery and she went through a recuperative care program and she was discharged back to the street afterwards. This is because the housing didn't exist. It's not because she wasn't connected to all of the services that are out there. I know another gentleman who suffers from serious mental illness. He's in and out of um, psychiatric, inpatient psychiatric units. Um, he has a mental health case worker. He goes to a mental, um, a, a, a day program for people with mental illness. Every time he goes into an inpatient unit or spends time in the hospital because he's also very ill, he has a discharge planning nurse and he gets discharged back to the street because they can't find a place for him to live. Quite frankly, um, what we need is money. We need more funding and I feel that the county really needs to step up it spends very little to no, none of its own budget on permanent supportive housing or affordable housing for people who are homeless. And as long as that remains the case, we're not going to solve this problem. Two things I want to say or ask. So the county just passed a budget yesterday. Uh, Supervisor, can you tell us whether um, there are any, any pieces of funding for, for housing in that? Um, and we'll come back, but I do want to talk about, um, it's very interesting when you talk about that 60-year-old uh, that 60, 60 woman with open heart surgery, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, talking about re recuperative care. Um, uh, you know, when I did some reporting, noticing uh, on homeless deaths, I, I was really surprised to see how many people were dying on the streets that were um, considered homeless by uh, the way the coroner's data um, sort of defines them to be homeless, which is not to have a home address. Um, but it was, in, it was amazing uh, the way, uh, it really was just a combination of um, perhaps heart failure with uh, a drug overdose um, or multiple health ailments that I feel, even as a person who has a home, can go and take care of themselves. Diabetes, you know, um, mm -hmm. uncontrolled diabetes plus um, hypertension or something. And to me, those seem like regular health elements that um, you and I maybe can overcome if we had a house or something like that. Um, I'm sorry? And some care, and some care. Um, the, and, and the research really supports what you're saying. Um, public health experts see housing as the most important public health intervention for people who are homeless. Because the research shows that once you get housed, um, you, you start getting better. Homelessness is bad for your health, it makes you sick, and it increases your risk of dying. Uh, Smitty, uh, you're on the ground at Civic Center. Um, what are some of, you, uh, some of the people over there suffering right now um, who may have unfortunately Insect passed bites. away? Insect bites, uh, <laughs> colds. Rashes, open sores, infections from substance abuse. But I, I'm I'm hearing I'm hearing a lot. But the only thing that's new is the housing first model. Now the the wraparound services, the county services, these things have always been there for years. If they were wanted, they would have kept been got. They only want them when they're brought to them. We don't have that yet. We expect the people who live on the streets to automatically jump up and say, I want to be housed or I want this service. Well, they're, not, they're not saying that. If you bring it to them wrapped in a nice package, something new, they'll jump on it. But you're bringing the same old things. I mean, the, this talk of the silos of the county services. The county services have always been there. They started something new in October, I believe it was. They brought the 
social services van to the civic center. I remember seeing that van. And it was out. Only I remember to be that board of supervisors <laughs> conversation, and it I was think only supposed to be there the for a couple day, of months. There was a van. <laughs> I, re I think I still have a picture of that actually. But uh, um, Paul, you wanted to say something. Well, yeah, recuperative care, and that's where I met you when we were talking about the deaths that, that were on the street. That was the, the 181 streets. deaths. And I think at the time you didn't realize, like a lot of people in Orange County, that recuperative care um, across the nation, there's about 110 of them. Orange County, we actually have a recuperative care. It's a paid um, service, that, or it's a paid um, by Cal Optima um, for patients that are homeless and they come to recuperative care and then we connect them to housing. LA County fills our recuperative care up. Orange County, we average around six to seven patients per day. And so a, a paid benefit for a homeless individual who is already sick, it, it's, it, you know, it, it shouldn't be. We should be filling it up with Orange County residents and I think that lends it to itself to how much we have to gain knowledge and teach um, Orange County residents about homelessness and about where do these people go and have them understand that for you and I it's difficult. You can only imagine if you're homeless and you're sick. I mean that that's the worst of all things and and so we have this benefit and no one's even using it. So I, I think there's so much work to be done, um, but not only at the supervisor level. I, I don't want to put Supervisor Doe on the hot spot because the cities need to get involved too, and many of them don't even show up. Um, the what? hospitals, the, all the agencies that we are paying taxes to, we need to put their feet to the fire and say, what are you doing for us? And I think you've seen the city of Anaheim, the city of Santa Ana right. sort of step up right now um, right. with some funding toward housing options. And Anaheim and coming, coming home, they started a coming, coming home. home right. But think about it, 3.2 million people, for myself, we've been doing this 10 years, and I can count on one hand the programs that we've started. That's deplorable. Um, we've got to do better, and, and it starts with the leadership. But then one of the other things is, this, it, you, Eve, you talked about, well, if you are going into recuperative care, you get better from your surgery, where do you go after? And well, I know, yeah, exactly. I know Illuminate Nation Foundation and Dawn, you guys are working on trying to get people into housing right well, now, we, and that seems... We're very new into psychiatric re recuperative care, so we're working with Mission Hospital and taking their psychiatric dis discharge and substance abuse discharges. And what we had in negotiating that, we had to I educate them that we there's no simple housing solution. So we have to be, they, and they are thankfully in it for the long term and they're willing to stay as long as it takes so that we're not exiting people to the street. Uh, but that was an education process, and it had to do with their values and our values being aligned. So we need more of that. We need more of the, those public-private um, partnerships and those hospital-private organization partnerships. I want to come back to Supervisor Doe. Um, that was the second part of that question, which was the county budget being passed yesterday. What type of funding, how much funding is available for some type of housing? Because that is ultimately, looks like the answer. Uh, the board um, funded a, a new uh, permanent housing development in Midway City, which will open later this year. It's called Potter's Lane, where we will use uh, modified steel shipping containers, uh, convert them, uh, repurpose them into innovative, cost-efficient way to provide permanent housing. Uh, and at the um, facility at this, in this development, there will also be wraparound services provided. So it won't be just putting people into... Uh, housing, but there will also be wraparound services provided by the different county departments. County funded? Um, is there a combination of, is that federal and state funded, county? It, it, it's a combination, yes. Uh, and and uh, it also shows the priority that we place on housing. That's, I mean, less, a lot of these things I know the funding is not strictly from the county, but we make the decision to allocate where to, to spend the money, which is just as important. Because I think ultimately, the question here is, are we trying to address housing, the housing stock, affordable housing? And I, I wanna give examples of where, yes, we are as a county doing that now. 
Um, Let's hear two more. And uh, the ha Orange County Housing Authority is also uh, planning to increase the number of vouchers available uh, for homeless individuals and family now to prioritize 35% of the annual turnovers now will be geared specifically for homeless, uh, homeless individuals and families. Uh, and the strategic plan also calls for $8 million in county housing funds uh, for use of up to 100 housing choice vouchers uh, for permanent supportive housing for homeless individuals, as well as uh, vast uh, vouchers for homeless veterans. Well, that, one, that one's the HUD funding. The, right, that's yeah. the rapid rehousing homeless veterans. Um, that's the $530,000 that is coming from, from HUD. So the federal government is, is funding that program. Well, we're working, we have to apply for these things and we are bringing it down and we are working to put, uh, put together the housing, affordable housing stock that we are talking about. Um, uh, Eve, you, real quick, and then I have one last question that I kind of want to wrap things up with. So um, the point I would like to make is that um, the federal government funds um, these, ha these housing choice vouchers, so commonly known as Section 8. Um, they reach about 25% of all people who need them. And like I said, the waiting list is very long. It's usually between four and eight years. So when you talk about turnover being, you know, prioritizing homeless people um, in the turnover of vouchers, these vouchers basically become available when somebody dies or no longer is, um, is eligible for the, for the voucher or moves out of the county or something like that. So. Um, this is why the, the list is so long, and this is why we really need the county to find ways, like Los Angeles County is doing at the, at the moment, to raise more revenue to supplement what is clearly inadequate funding from the feds and the state. Um, I want to wrap up because I do want to leave some time for questions. Uh, but one of the things uh, we talked about prior to our conversation on this stage was, you know, if we found ourselves homeless, because I think Susan Price is right, um, we're only a few paychecks away from being homeless. And that's something that I've always thought about, um, especially as a college student. Um, I, you know, I, we could all be homeless at any point, um, especially with a major illness. Uh, so. If we found ourselves homeless in Orange County right now, what, it, what are the options for us? Like what is the major, like one thing that we could do? And what needs to happen tomorrow? Like tomorrow, if we could do something to get us one step closer, what could we do tomorrow to get, to, to help solve this problem? Um, Supervisor Doe, we'll start with you. We'll go down the line. I will start uh, with um, the, the department that Susan Price will head up if we as a county have a system where there's only one number that people when they are in, in need of help, whether it be that, that daily need there at the moment or longer term need for help, they just have to call one number and that one department can uh, give them access to all of the county services as well as all of our uh, community partners. So it's up to us to put together a, a panoply of, of menu of uh, uh, options of help, of resources that people can tap into, and that should only be one place that they need to go to instead of trying to hunt down different phone numbers and different departments to try to get help. Wait, one follow up. Um, do you think that the multi service center in Anaheim in 2017 will play that role? Is that what you're thinking? No, I'm talking about a different, that's a uh, housing option. I'm talking here about whether the help would be for drug addiction, mental health, any of the issues that may contribute to homelessness. Mm -hmm. And all of that would be wrapped into that one department. So the help would not just be homelessness and housing alone, but others wrapped around services as well. Eve? Um, so if I became homeless tomorrow? Yeah. Uh, Scary thought. Yeah. So, <laughs> so obviously, I, I I wouldn't be able to get on the list for affordable housing. I don't qualify for permanent supportive housing because I haven't lived on the streets for a year and I don't have a serious, you know, a seriously disabling condition. So, what would my options be? Um, there's no year-round shelters right now. It's the, the, the summer, so right, we don't the, have. It's, it's the summer. Um, I might try to get into a program, but 
Um, they they might be filled up. Maybe I'd go stay in the civic center <laughs> or <are> down <laughs> down at the riverbed. I mean, literally, um, people are there because they've gone through the resource list. Nothing's available, and they have no other option. So I'm not sure what I would do as a as a woman. I would be worried about sleeping outside too. I'd probably find try to find some friends to 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 sleep near. I mean, th th this is the situation that we're putting people into. And t tomorrow, I mean, I don't think it's it's that quick of a fix, but um, but I would hope that the county would um, would develop a housing trust fund or some other way to create a dedicated source of funding so that we don't find ourselves in this fix and we really can um, create the amount of affordable housing and permanent supportive housing that we need so that every single person is, is housed and, are, and is living safely and with dignity. Paul? Yeah. <clears throat> well, if I was homeless, I probably wouldn't be here because the average life expectancy of a homeless individual is 50. It's true. So, which is really it's sad. really true, yeah. And I'm I've 61, so I would have been dead 11 years ago. Um, but if I could, I'd try to get to LA, Canada, Chicago, somebody who actually has really innovative, good homeless programs. And that's not um, reasonable here though. But um, there are a lot of really good nonprofits in Orange County that are doing really good work. And it's my hope that Susan assists all of us to bring these services together for um, the homeless. So if I was homeless tomorrow, I, I would hope that I could hang on long enough for her to engage all the services together. We are putting together. a lot of faith in you, Miss Price. <laughs> and, and basically, I, the one thing that for the last 10 years that I've really, really tried to get um, cities, counties to do is just to Start something, just take that risk. There's a saying that I heard at a homeless conference up in Portland a week ago, and it said, fail hard, fail hard. Try, because at least you're trying hard. some stuff. I, I think, and fail again, fast. you know, I know um, Supervisor Doe's got a lot of things on the table that, and we've talked, and I know they're gonna come forward. But I think we, we can't just wait for one home run or one knockout. We've got to start a, a lot of different programs like today, tomorrow. And, and hopefully um, one of them will show promise and we can scale it up. Don. Well, I think the, it, we've had some good suggestions if I found myself homeless. I think it's important for us to realize that all of us, uh, most of us in this room would have to take some imagination to get to that point of street homelessness. Most of us have a, a safety net. We have friends, we have family, and that's the difference we're talking about, and that's the imagination we have to have in order to have the kind of empathy for the people that we're trying to help that I think we need to solve this problem. Uh, in terms of what we need, I think we need a sense of urgency. Even a, a huge influx of funding to build units isn't gonna happen overnight. Um, but something like, something creative like tax incentives for current landlords to set aside a block of rooms at the fa um, fair market rent that these vouchers will pay could immediately change the landscape because the vouchers themselves aren't an enough of an answer. A third of the people in our rehabilitative shelter have a voucher in their hand right now and can't find a unit. Because the landlord won't because, accept one. Because they're not affordable. It's no. not just the landlord saying no, it's also the affordability. Uh, the fair market rent for a one bedroom apartment is slightly over $1,300 a month. Very hard to find a one bedroom apartment, particularly in Southern Orange County at that, at that level. So if we could incent landlords to take that first step and do that first apartment, what our landlords are finding, the land landlords we work with, is they get paid on time and that if there is a problem, if there is a disturbance or some issue, we're there. We're there in the middle of the night if we need to be, which is different from their other tenants who also have, it's, it's not just a homeless issue that people have mental health illness or people have 
um, substance abuse. Landlords are already dealing with that. The difference is when they deal with a permanent supportive housing program, there's somebody to come and help. So if we can incent landlords to try this, we could do that with a policy change very quickly. And that would be a huge game changer to open up units for us. Smitty. Well, uh, you're in a unique position because... That, that's an interesting question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the truth is, well, the one thing I wouldn't do is call a county number because you're either put on hold or you're told there's nothing available. The, the, the situation out right, right now with all of the agencies and the social services, there's nothing they can do because there's no place for you to go. Uh, Don's got a great idea. Start thinking of new ideas. This old, used I, agency, the county, you're depending on the county for solutions. They have so much red tape that they have to go through before they can give you a bus pass. <laughs> You've got to sign three forms just to get a one-day bus pass if you have to go to the doctor. But that's if you can catch the person who's passing them out. That there's too much to go through just to get help depending on the county. So you would cut the red tape and... No, well, not only cut the red tape, involve the community, involve the businesses, involve the people, get, there's tons of money in this county. I mean, it's one of the richest counties in the country, but you keep asking the county for money. <laughs> the money's out there already. It's, it's, some of it's sitting here. But you can't get involved because of the county red tape, because there's rules and policies that won't allow you to help the homeless. So an easier way, um, clearing the path, and also trying new and innovative things. Exactly. Uh, I want to say, uh, um, we're going to switch now. Thank you so much, you guys, for participating in this conversation. Thank you, guys. We're going to switch now to give you guys an opportunity to ask some questions. I've got a list here. For, thank you for, for um, bringing your questions on the comment cards. I'm going to read out a list of, of, of folks if you will please line up on that corner over here. She's raising her hand, that's Liz. She's got a microphone for you. Um, let me have Elizabeth Hansberg, Terry H, Nathan Burnham. Sorry if I'm saying your name, Burnham. Uh, John, is a question about um, governmental housing funding, uh, but there's no last name on that. So John with government housing funding. Um, Raymond Kathy Tillotson. Charles Evans. And Barbara, we're going to try to get through these questions. In the meantime, I want to let you guys know that, um, so we're having this conversation on social media. I hope you guys were participating with our hashtag, um, OC Homeless. Uh, we've got a comment from, a, tw a Twitter question, actually. A question from Twitter, um, from at Crest1995 is their handle. Are there plenty of seminars to help homeless people get back into society? Uh, who wants to answer this? One person while we get these folks lined up. Well, I, I want to just do a shout out for National Healthcare for the Homeless. It's a nonprofit that works with the homeless. They actually have the biggest consumer group. Consumers are involved with all their, their clinics, all their seminars. They're invited to attend their national conferences and they pay for them. Um, they're national and it's just an incredible group that, and I, I have not ever seen a organization that involves consumers. So and when you say consumers, to, you're talking about clients, home, um, homeless, homeless individuals, people, right. right? Consumers of, of, of the, the services, social, yeah, right? The services. Um, but they are they they have seminars, they have webinars, they make it possible for homeless individuals across the nation to see, view them, and it's a great organization. All right. Um, well, thank you, Crest1995 out there. Uh, let's get started. Uh, tell me your name. Um, tell me what part of Orange County you are from. Okay, uh, I'm Nathan Birnbaum. I'm here uh, from the Orange County Needle Exchange Program. And so 
what I want to ask is, you know, we kind of alluded a little bit to the increase in deaths among the homeless, and a large percentage of that are individuals who died from overdoses That's of right. subs for substance abuse. And so I want to know why this county still remains so uh, unwilling to invest in harm reduction and other services that save lives and save money in the long run. For example, this past week, through the naloxone that we hand out to our clients, the hundredth person who reversed an overdose is still alive because of that. So why, why, why are we not investing? I think that one's directed at you, <laughs> Supervisor Doe. Well, the question is, is why are we not investing in it? I, I, that's assume a, f a fact that I don't know if it's true. I don't know if the county of Orange, in fact, doesn't do any of the things you say that it doesn't. So, um, if, are you? Is, what's the question specifically? What program is it that we that you think we should be doing that we're not? He's asking whether there should be funding for a needle exchange program and why the, maybe the county um, has not funded one of those programs just yet, right? Well, well we do exist. We are the only state-sanctioned needle exchange in Orange County. We receive no funding at all right, from, the from the county. Right, from the county. Yeah. Right. right. So, uh, so ultimately, would the county be willing? I, or maybe I should ask, would Supervisor Doe be willing <laughs> to entertain an idea about whether the county could fund a drug, uh, a needle exchange program? The health aspect of it obviously is good, but is, to me as, as, a, as a lawyer and as a D, former DA, is in the implement, implementation of, of the policy because I also am concerned about the, the issue of, of needles being out on the street, being in, in the neighborhood. So how, how do we administer such a program? So the, the devil is in the detail. I'm, I'm not viscerally against the concept. You'd be willing to have a conversation about it. Absolutely, okay. yes. Um, very good, next. <laughs> Uh, Tell me your name you, and where, um, where you're from, either what part of Orange County or what group you're with. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Hansberg. I'm a resident of Fullerton, which you may know was the site of the first two attempts at establishing a shelter um, yes. by Supervisor Sean Nelson. So my question is, I think, probably also geared to the supervisor. So we know that the lack of affordable housing is a major issue, and, and we can distinguish between housing where we need wraparound services and you know, for people with mental health issues. But we can also talk about you know, two, two parent working families where each parent is working two jobs, minimum wage, you know, nobody's at home to take care of the kids and where, you know, as you said, $1,300 is not gonna pay for one bedroom apartment. You need at least 16 to 1,700. Um, and that's for a one bedroom. I don't wanna live in a one bedroom house with my three kids. Um, so what I've seen is that there is a resistance to development of any kind. I mean, even, you know, right now in Fullerton, you know, go before the Planning Commission. People are up in arms about the desire to build $750,000 townhomes. Certainly that's not affordable. Um, so we have a problem of basically NIMBY. Nobody wants ho homeless shelters in their backyard, right? We saw that in Fullerton. Or low-income housing. Right, low-income housing. A community of friends tried to put something in on Commonwealth Avenue in Fullerton there was met with major resistance. The only place they could put it is in the industrial area down by the 91. So we have to engage. My, my point is, and I want this to be highlighted, you know, and it, and it needs to be a policy issue. There needs to be a public education campaign. We need to work with communities that, you know, with John and Jane Q homeowner to, you know, integrate these people into our communities. We need to take away the fear of what's going to happen to my property value if they build, you know, uh, an, uh, you know if, even if they just build a market rate complex. So where, I, I think what you're saying is what can we do right now in order to encourage low-income housing development? Sure. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, um, Don, I want, I, I want you to see if you can maybe I, I tackle that I think we have one. to listen to the concerns first. And then I think we need to help people understand, sort of demystify and, and take away some of the fear. I think if we say in this room, is there anyone in this room who doesn't know a housed person, one housed person who has an addiction? We all know someone with an addiction who's housed. Do we know any, anyone in this room who doesn't know a housed person who has a mental health challenge? 
Hmm. Well, these are the people we're talking about housing. They happen to be homeless. They're not going to be homeless once we house them. Right. So they're going to act a lot like your neighbor, your friend, your coworker who's housed. So you take away that stigma and that fear. There's this sense that, and I think it comes out of not wanting to imagine ourselves homeless, that the people who are homeless must be so different than us that we need to keep them away from us. That's just not my experience working with homeless people every day. And I think the more we can help people see their own sphere of friends within the homeless population, the easier it becomes to accept that kind of housing in their community. Uh, Paul, I, I just want, I agree totally, and, and Don, like, and I are providers. We get it, and most of the people in the room get it, but we need champions in the community who are unlikely heroes to step up and say, I won't mind if a homeless individual lives next door to me. We need those individuals, and the county doesn't have it. This would be a good opportunity for the Board of Supervisors to take on a education campaign and to fund that. So Let's share widely this conversation. Um, the, the, well, no, no, the, because the, the comment was directed at the county. Let's, let's take a step back. Realize that when it comes to city decisions as far as, as housing and where, what you can build and where you can build it, the county has no control over that. Well, you're saying we, the we, county only has control over unincorporated that's areas. Right. Let's, let's be serious about it. Like in my county, we have a, an area of maybe about four square miles that's within the county control. So therefore, I, I think to, to lay the responsibility at the county, that's up to the cities to decide what they do within their boundaries. Can I challenge you to say that because there is no one city in Orange County that steps up the way maybe Los Angeles does, um, because it is the only city, the largest city in that county, that perhaps the Board of Supervisors has to sort of step up and be that leader within Orange County. And that's what we have done with the Potter's Lane. It is in county land. It is the only small so section that I mentioned that we put our uh, for, um, permanent housing, affordable housing in there. So city so. officials, otherwise in yeah. Orange County, um, I think what we're hearing is we want more collaboration. Um, I, I'm so sorry, I wanna make sure we get through some of these questions because I know that's part of the reason why you guys came out tonight. Hi, um, I'm Carolyn, I'm actually calling, um, asking a question from my friend Terry, who's not here, he lives in a van. But first I wanted to address the fact that Don said that um, people who are homeless are not that different from you. I was, I'm sorry, I was homeless last fall, from August to November, <laughs> sorry. It's okay, take your time. Living in my car. I had a job, I had temp jobs in Irvine. I had to live in Torrance, I had to sleep in my car in Torrance and um, places where I knew I could park overnight, and this speaks directly to Terry's question. Um, also, I'm not so different from you. I have degrees from Juilliard and MIT, and wow. people can't believe that I was actually homeless. So it can happen to anybody. Um, so Terry lives in his van. He has no permanent home. His question is verbatim from Facebook. Why have so many cities passed I'm sorry, I can't read. Why have so many cities passed or are pa planning to pass ordinances making it nearly impossible for vehicle dollars to find safe places to park overnight? The vast majority of them are good people. They just want to sleep without fear of being broken into. And I wanted to f sleep with fear of not somebody not breaking into my car. So I just wanted to let you know. Thank you for sharing your story. I know that was really tough. And thank you for being so tough. I've got to say, um, I see a lot of parking restrictions along um, city streets, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm a resident of the city of Long Beach, actually, and um, there are a lot of parking restrictions, actually, where I live, and there are a lot of RVs who can actually park there, and I don't mind, but, um, but there are a lot of, uh, of restrictions where RVs, you can't have a certain height, uh, you can't take up too many, uh, too many lengths of, of feet here, or you can't park overnight or something like that. Um, um, I don't know, what, what should be the answer there? Should we lift those uh, parking restrictions? Um, should we not? Um, sh there are some cities up in the northern part of California that allow churches to then open up their parking lots and say, 
why don't you come and park in our overnight parking lot and you can sleep here and do that. Is, do you guys know if anybody's doing that here in Orange County? No? No, San Diego. Walmart's doing it? Wow, yeah. what, what, what part of Orange County? And Fullerton? Nationwide. At the Walmart in Torrance. Because you could sleep in there, and, 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 and you felt safer in your car. Um, no. All around. There are lots of lights and cameras all around, and that's what allowed you to be able to feel a little safer um, sleeping in the Walmart parking lot there. Um, maybe there should be some policies on that, on allowing uh, maybe churches, Walmart parking lots, more organizations to sort of open up their parking lots to to allow homeless uh, folks who have a car um, to sleep there. How do y'all guys feel about that? Well, San Diego has a really big program that someone sent me um, the information on that, and it's working well. They, they pull in there at night and then leave in the morning. Um, but yes, that would definitely, but we'd have to find a city that would let us put that parking lot in their city. Anybody city officials listening to us? <laughs> um, let's move on to our next question. My name's Kathy Tillotson, I'm with Build Futures, and I've done what someone had suggested, created an innovative, unique model to house homeless 18 to 24 year olds, and um, it can be done. We don't turn anyone away, so anybody who wants to be housed, we help. So I'll give you cards, Larry. But the question is, um, can we make the legal system when they're letting 18 to 24 year olds out of juvenile hall or jail, make sure they have IDs and a social security card because that is a huge problem. We're all volunteer, we don't have funding, but if we have to get them an ID and social security card, you're talking about you have to house them for a good solid month, you know, maybe longer while you're waiting. You might have to get the birth certificate first. So this is a long period of time of paying for housing when they can't get a job, nor can they even get into the job programs like the WIOA, the Workforce Investment uh, Innovation Program. They can't even go in that to get job readiness training until they have these right to work documentation. An so identification they, card is so important. Yeah, but they let them out of the juvenile halls or the jails and they have nothing. I, I'll say in my reporting, I've asked the Orange County um, Sheriff's Department if they keep identification cards. Uh, I've, I've interviewed a couple of homeless people who say, oh, it's it stayed at the jail. So when I've Mm -hmm. interviewed a couple of sheriff officials, they say, no, you know, we're, we give them back. Um, I haven't decided, <laughs> I haven't, haven't been able to figure out whether that stays at the jail um, or if somebody else loses it, but um, it does seem like having an ident identification card is a barrier sometimes, or not having it is a barrier into accessing certain benefits, um, but also it's a, it's a, it's a dignity issue, right? You, so everybody has an identity, and if you can't prove who you are, especially when you're homeless, um, what does that mean? Right, that's, all these programs, the and then the yeah. right to work. I mean, you have to prove that you're allowed to work. Um, I'm gonna move on to the next question to make sure we can get everybody, because it's about uh, 8.45, but I wanna make sure we get more questions in. Go ahead. Thank you, panel, for being here. My name is Raymond Hartwell. I'm president of Ask Me Local 2076. We represent Orange County eligibility workers who work in social services agency, healthcare agency, and we deal with things such as general relief, which is funded by the county. We recently went to the Board of Supervisors meeting earlier this week and we listened to them do a budget presentation. One of the things that we often hear are many excuses as to why the county cannot assist this issue of housing and affordable, affordable housing. So my question is, in terms of the county budget, what are the top five priorities for the county budget, and what percentage of that is going to affordable housing? <laughs> Supervisor Doe. You're asking me to sift through $6.1 billion worth of budget to uh, identify items, but I'm gonna do my best. Um, if I'm looking at uh, this list here correctly, um, from the uh, Orange County Community Services uh, Department. There are six funding sources um, of the different types of housing uh, programs. Uh, anything from strategic priority, affordable housing, to Cal Home Program Reuse Fund, to OC Housing. 
I'm looking at about a, almost $170, $580 million in allocation. Can I ask a so. follow-up? How does that, if you have um, the information, how does that compare to last year's budget? I'm sorry, this one doesn't have last year's for okay. me to compare. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you do you know? I just no, I don't. Okay. no, I don't. If you wanted to say something? Um, yeah, can, can I just note that um, almost all of that funding goes to people who are already housed. So people... How do you mean? That, well, if you have a Section 8 voucher, it needs to be refunded every year, I see. for example. So most of the funding from the, from the state, from the feds, um, go to permanent supportive housing units and affordable housing units that already exist in, and are already um, occupied. To maintain right. that type to of housing. To maintain that, that type of housing. I think while, we're, while we're on the subject of financial, I think it's important, and none of us have noted, the cost savings that we can realize by housing people. Uh, the most recent, the, 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 the closest geographic data that I've seen is the LA County data, the study done in, in Los Angeles. And it's about a, a two-thirds reduction in public cost when you put someone in housing versus leaving them on the street. We're talking about something from, you know, 63 uh, $1,000 down to $26,000 when you get somebody housed. And so that's a s tremendous savings. And I think a real um, challenge and opportunity for a coordinated uh, system because those savings don't come in one chunk. They're, they're across departments. There's jail savings. There's mm -hmm. health care savings. There's uh, emergency, emergency response room, savings. Yeah. Emergency room savings. And, and but if we can look at it in a coordinated fashion and, and recognize some of that saved money when we start housing people, there will be more money available for those ongoing. It's about $175 million it looks like, but it sounds like some of that is also already being used for current housing opportunities. Er, and, and can I just projects. say, it, I, I agree s completely with Dawn, and, and I often say, um, you know, the Board of Supervisors might say, we can't afford to do this. Well. Actually, we can't afford not to do it exactly. because we're spending so much more money um, um, in pu public funds on people homeless than we would if they were housed. And it's the humane thing to do. Thank you for your question. Hello, good evening, everybody. My name is uh, Charles Hi. Evans, and I'm the regional director for an organization called School on the Wheels. And uh, we provide tutoring services for homeless children throughout Southern California. Uh, in Orange County, we provided about uh, last year about 500 homeless children with uh, tutoring service in addition to backpacks and school supplies. Uh, so throughout this night, we've been talking about homelessness and we talk about the mentally, mentally ill, the drug addicted, but we have yet to talk about any children. The average age of a homeless person in America is nine years old. What are we doing in Orange County to provide support for the homeless children uh, experience and homelessness throughout Orange County. Paul, and, uh, you work a lot with homeless families. Yeah, <clears throat> well, actually, the, that's where the cities have stepped up a lot. Anaheim, again, had funded um, 95 families that were um, unstably housed, the whole families, and we had funded, we had housed them for an entire year. In that year, and, and Anaheim School District paid for it, um, we actually, their attendance had went up from missing 39 days a year to less than one. And their grade point average went up from 1.6 to 2.3. Um, but even in that, there was savings because when they attend school, the school district gets funding. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's somewhere around 800,000 that they saved for those I think it was 170 kids because they attended schools. So um, cities have really, that's the part that they have stepped up to take care of children and families. If I had to pick one group, we're probably doing more for young children. But again, like everything else, the mental health um, of those children is really, really the trauma they've been through. We haven't even started to address that yet. So that, that's probably the 
the next biggest step. I should add that you know, I think the 2015 point in time count also found that there was a 14% decrease in the number of families that were counted. Um, so there seems to be some progress. And I think mm -hmm. that Orange County has done um, some progress on, on trying to get homeless families off the street. Absolutely. Uh, and I want to respond to the question also. Um, the juvenile component of our effort uh, in terms of the care coordination and the uh, uh, children and families to commission is a big component of what we do in the county as well. I'm working with uh, uh, Judge Maria Hernandez, who's uh, head of juvenile court, and also a lot of stakeholders working with juveniles in order to put those programs together. That is a, an emphasis that I put on in terms of my overall uh, attempt to address both homelessness and uh, mental health. Next question. So my name is Mohini Balkavitanov, and I'm a clinical social worker, and I've worked in LA and Orange County in permanent housing, and I really like the housing first model. And my question to you is, so I heard about what is being done in Midway City in regards to providing permanent housing with on-site services. And is there room in the budget for similar projects like this planned in other cities? Other than Midway City is what you're saying? Other than Midway City, yes. Yeah. Midway City just is a misnomer. It's actually not a city. It's county unincorporated area. And as you know, the county, we only have jurisdiction over unincorporated land in the county. So uh, as, as far as you mean cities, then we really can't control that. But within the areas that we do control uh, and the resources that we have, yes, we are definitely uh, fo focusing and targeting facilities that we can use to add to our housing and also wraparound treatment uh, for homeless. I, I don't know if um, any of, I can't speak to obviously the county budget and the county fund budget, but I know that um, with HUD funding, there are a few more um, of those four bonus projects that mm -hmm. the county did get, which is um, Paul, one of your groups, Illumination Foundation, is yeah. doing the street to homeless, and that's supposed to target, um, it was like almost 100 individuals, yeah, right? Correct, correct. And, and so then we also have the rapid rehousing. I think you mentioned mm -hmm. that actually yeah. for the veterans, as the vouchers, yeah. um, that's supposed to. Um, M MHSA. Too. I was just going to say, funding. MHSA right. funding, and that right. can go, I mean, we just f completed a renovation of two apartment buildings in San Clemente right. with MHSA funding, so those projects don't have to be on county land. They can right. be, that funding right. can go anywhere. And so, I think that's the unique problem um, with uh, trying to find permanent supportive housing or even rapid rehousing is that you don't see it. It's not like um, there is a corner in Anaheim where this is a big O development and that's like well, that's what we're going to call permanent supportive housing, right? It, it, we're talking about individual units spread all over the counties. So you may have a unit in Costa Mesa or a unit in, in, in Fullerton, and all of those sort of collected together is supposed to um, uh, be the entire permanent supportive housing project. Right, but we also do have dedicated sites. We that's right. also do have dedicated permanent supportive housing sites, and we have our homeless clients asking us for that. We have people... No, they want, they want to, to stick... We, we have people at, at the ASL emergency shelter that we operate who are telling us... I, In Laguna I'm not, Beach, right? I'm not ready until I know I can be with people I know and trust. And so when we're talking about people with a serious mental health challenge, again, that community matters. Yeah, scattered housing sites are, are what is working in Orange County now. And the next evolution is micro-communities where, just as Don was saying, a lot of groups are living together, but yet the city doesn't feel like there's a shelter or a huge homeless population, and every city is hopefully gonna take care of their own, so. Uh, our last question. Hi, um, <clears throat> Phil Bowers, Volunteers of America. We hadn't talked about uh, homeless veterans, and so I just wanted to mention a couple of things. Uh, so uh, Virginia Dame is the Director of Veteran Services, uh, VOA. She's in the audience, I just wanted to, to it's basically, basically related to affordable housing. And the bottom line is, so the SSVF program is a VA housing program. Uh, it's a rapid rehousing uh, program. And so it's housing first model. Uh, we use presumptive eligibility. If a person says they're a vet, they're a vet. Um, before we can pay money, pay the rent and stuff, we have to get identification. Um, so, but bottom line is, uh, um, and also um, Virginia isn't helping us, we're, we're applying for the, to, for the shelter with uh, some partners here. Anyhow, we pay for up to nine months of rent. We pay for move-in deposit. We can buy refrigerators, beds for veterans and their households. Mm -hmm. 
And the biggest problem we have, we got a lot of money. We have millions of dollars per year, per grant year, and uh, just for Orange County. And the biggest problem that we have is affordable housing. Uh, our, our, what we call a takedown list of homeless veterans here in Orange County is about, uh, last time I looked, it's about 250 vets on the list. Of course, there's more. Uh, I also work in LA. It's, it's about 2,500 on a, the list in, in Los Angeles. But the point being, uh, if we could get enough affordable housing, we have the money. We can get that list knocked down, uh, for at least from the standpoint of, of veterans and their families. Uh, and then we also do prevention, so that if, uh, if a, that's one of the homelessness, uh, that's one way to prevent homelessness is prevention side and you know help people with, that are behind in their rent being evicted. We do that too. So more so, affordable housing stock. Mm -hmm. So affordable housing stock is the big deal. Uh, that's <laughs> We got the money. If, if we can, if we if we can pay somebody nine months of their rent, their moving deposit, storage, all that stuff, which we can, and we have the money to do it right this minute. But we there's no affordable, not enough affordable housing to do that. That's a real problem. We can pay that stuff right this minute. That seems to be the reoccurring theme tonight. Is saying <laughs> units, we just units, need units. more housing <laughs> stock. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I think we had one more here. Do we? Oh, okay. Great. Um, I'm just going to wrap this up right now because it's about 9 o'clock and I know you guys have all, it's a, it's a work week night and I wanted to thank you so much for coming out here and talking to us and having this conversation because I obviously we're passionate about it. We know that there are solutions and we know that we can get to them when we collaborate with each other. Thank you so much for participating, for participating online and I hope... You guys will stay connected to KPCC. Thank you so much. And thank you for, for being with us. Thanks. Have a good night.